In all the long history of our republic, the Constitution of the United States has been amended 27 times. With us today, a man who would like to amend it several more times as fast as he can. The 48th governor of the Lone Star State, Greg Abbott. Uncommon knowledge? Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge on behalf of the our hosts here in Austin, Texas, the Texas Public Policy Foundation, I'm Peter Robinson. This past January, the 48th governor of Texas called for a convention to amend the Constitution of the United States. I'm qu quoting from the Texas plan, which is the plan that the governor, 92 page document that the governor released, you can find it on the governor's website. I'm quoting from the Texas plan. <clears throat> The Texas plan is not so much a vision to alter the Constitution as it is a call to restore the rule of our current one. Reaction. The editorial board of the Dallas Morning News, Abbott's call sets a dangerous precedent. The editorial board of the Houston Chronicle, Abbott's proposal is an interesting intellectual exercise. By the way, Governor, as far as I am aware, you're the only Republican office holder in the whole country who's being accused of intellectual exercises. <laughs> <clears throat> An interesting intellectual exercise, but we suspect it's more an appeal to the rabid anti-government crowd in his party than a sincere effort to find productive solutions. Then there was Erica Greider of the Texas Monthly. I thought the governor gave a great speech, and I emerged into the sunny winter afternoon with a youthful buoyancy I haven't felt about Texas politics. Governor Abbott, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Let me return to that quotation. The Texas plan is not so much a vision to alter the Constitution as it is a plan to restore the rule of our current one. And we'll come to the specific provisions you're recommending in a moment. But first, 34 states have to approve of this, so petition Congress to call a convention, a convention has to take place, and then 34 states have to approve the result of the convention. That seems like a lot of trouble to go to if what you're trying to do is restore the Constitution we already have. Governor, explain yourself. Well, first, we need to understand the dire situation that the country is in. Uh, the fact of the matter is, all three branches of our federal government have strayed from their constitutional design. Americans are frustrated. We see this in the context of the presidential election right now. People are mystified about what's going on, but there's reality underneath the hood of the angst that we're seeing across the country. And it's because people are fed up with a government that is not responsive to their needs. And the reason why that's occurring is because of institutional dysfunction. I submit to you that regardless of who gets elected as president of the United States, they will not be able to fix the problems that we have right now in the United States because the problems are so endemic in each branch of government that it is going to require a convention of states to repair the damage that has been done to our Constitution. A convention of states. <clears throat> Article 5 of the Constitution provides for two, away, two ways to amend the document. One is for amendments to be proposed by two-thirds of each House of Congress. That's one. Two is for three-quarters of states to petition Congress to call a constitutional convention. Now, the first method has been used 33 times, including all 27 times the Constitution has been amended, and the second me mechanism in all the long and glorious history of this republic, bupkis hasn't been used once. It sounds as though you're trying to climb the highest, hardest. Why? Why number two? First, because number one is broken. Uh, it's important that people understand, and, and so many people think that a convention of states is like coming out of nowhere. The fact of the matter is convention of states is coming out of, of the genius of James Madison, of Alexander Hamilton, of those who wrote the Constitution themselves, they knew in advance the exact precise problem that we would face today. And that is there would be a time uh, when the institution of the federal government had turned its back on the people they were supposed to represent. And there would be only one pathway to fix the problems we face. And that would not be from those who represent us in Congress, but it would be from the people. Remember this. The founders set forth in the first three words of the Constitution the most important organization that exists in the country, and that is, we the people. And they instilled that in Article 5 
to ensure that we, the people, would have a pathway to fix our constitutional problems. Now, you say it hasn't been used. Let's be clear about what has happened. One is, look at the 17th Amendment, for example. Uh, for the 17th Amendment, there were a lot of people who uh, were behind a convention of states to pass the 17th Amendment. As I, if I understand it correctly, the United States was one state short of having enough states for a convention of states to pass the 17th Amendment. And Congress said, whoa, we don't want that to happen. So they got together and they passed it on their own. There have been Which some... was what date, roughly? Do you remember? Uh, don't have that. Early 1900s. All right. Uh, re more recently, uh, close to the Reagan era, there were 32 of the 34 states needed in order to pass a balanced budget amendment. That's something that, that frankly, we could probably galvanize uh, in the next 24 hours to get enough states to get together if they realize that is all that we were going to focus on. Part of the challenge that we deal with that is easy to deal with is so many people get concerned, well, gosh, if we, if we have a convention of states to, for a balanced budget amendment, what kind of evils might occur from that? Mm -hmm. I have easy answers for that. All right, we'll get, so the Texas plan addresses, you're very explicit in addressing <clears throat> all three branches of the federal government plus the states. So let's just go through this category by category by category and <clears throat> unfold your mind, unfold sure. your thinking. Congress. Congress, you say, has strayed far from its constitutional role. And the first question is, how can that be? Members of Congress are elected directly by the people, members of the House, every two years. You would suppose that, that, that this would be a, a, a responsive democratic institution. What's wrong and how did it happen in Congress? Well, the, there, there are several catalysts behind it. Uh, one catalyst behind it is because the other two branches of government partnered with Congress to trample the Constitution. The, the easiest example of that uh, is what we have seen uh, with regard to the Commerce Clause. Uh, if you pull out the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution, it gives Congress to regulate trade with Indian tribes, uh, international trade, and trade, quote, among the states. In the 1930s, which is when most of the damage was done to the United States Constitution, the Supreme Court allowed the Constitution to be rewritten and began to allow Congress to regulate commerce that occurred solely within one state. So much so, now, if you happen to have a bug on your property, you're gonna be regulated. You're from California. Uh, in California, not too far away from you. It was a low blow, <laughs> uh, There, There is a 40-acre plot of land where they wanted to build a new hospital. But yet, on the day they were gonna break ground on that new hospital, they were shut down because there was a fly that had a lifespan ranging from six to eight days. And they needed to protect that fly. And in fact, at one point in time, they were gonna shut down the entire San Bernardino Freeway for a period of time because of that one single fly. So pursuant to federal regulations, an insect that exists only in a small, small parcel of one individual state, got it. The federal government reached in and told people right. how to behave. Okay. It, 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 let, let's turn this into tangible examples so people right. can understand, connect it with the real lives, because we dealt with this here in the state of Texas. Uh, we have uh, the sage brush dune lizard in West Texas that exists only in West Texas, uh, and the group in charge of this uh, in the federal government uh, was going to perhaps shut down oil and gas drilling operations in West Texas because of this little lizard that had happily coexisted with the oil and gas industry for decades. Uh, and so this could have been a multi-billion dollar catastrophe. And the entire state apparatus in the state of Texas came out against it. I told my team at the Attorney General's office where I was serving at the time that I was prepared to open a lizard litigation unit to fight back <laughs> against Washington, D.C. if we had to. And they backed down. But that's what it takes. It takes states to stand up to an overreaching federal government to force them to back down. It should not come to states. It should come from Washington, uh, Washington D.C. because it's not. It is time for the states and the people to stand up to Washington, D.C. Right. Here's a question <clears throat> that we need to address but that runs through the whole conversation. How specific are you, do you choose to be right now in proposing amendments, and let's deal with Congress, in proposing amendments to put Congress back within the constitutional order? When you gave your speech in January, you proposed nine amendments. I understand that in this book, 
which I'm, it's my pleasure to hold up, broken but unbowed. unbowed. You discuss the amendments again. Your thinking is, is evolving. The politics of it, uh, how you intend to garner support in, among enough states, but also with regard to the specific amendments. And Mike, so tell me a little bit about the process. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, and let's be clear about that because um, what I believe in and what needs to be done is that we have a convention of states because Washington cannot fix itself from the inside out. Uh, America needs to be recreated the same way that it was created, which is from the people. And I articulated in that book exactly what I articulated uh, in my speech and plan that I announced in January, and that is to have a convention of states. What differs and is subject to variation is exactly what constitutional amendments will be proposed. And the way this works is states should agree in advance on what constitutional amendments should be proposed. You mentioned Congress. I can, I can mention several easy ones, for example, uh, that should be considered, and I think it should be up to the states to decide if they're in on this before we have a convention. One, we need a balanced budget amendment. Two, we have term limits. Three, we limit the Commerce Clause uh, so that we return the Commerce Clause to the way that it was written, the way that it exists in the language in the Constitution itself right now. And that is, Congress does not have the authority to pass any law regulating commerce that is wholly intrastate. Okay. Can I, um, let's just take one of those, the balanced budget amendment. <clears throat> so let me give you, I can, well, you can anticipate the arguments. Here's an argument that's easy to anticipate. It has to be de easy to anticipate because I wouldn't have thought of it otherwise. And the argument runs as follows. How do you actually know when the, gov when the budget is in balance? Who decides what's a capital expense? Who decides how we should amortize capital expenses? Straight line amortization? Oh, it, or do you really want a balanced budget amendment to be really rigorous, has to incorporate into the Constitution of the United States generally approved accounting principles? Or do you really want to turn the, the document into an accounting document, Governor? Well, what we do- You see the trouble? Uh, <laughs> a actually, because we actually balance our budget in the state of Texas, I don't see the trouble. Uh, be, 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 because, <laughs> you know, because, nobody told me you how much you fight dirty. <laughs> because, because families at home who are watching this, they have to balance their budget. They don't get to go to the bank and say, listen, I got this amortization deal here. Uh, they have to pay their bills, and they can pay their bills only based upon the income they have. And the United States of America has to live by that same standard. Think about this. The United States of America is now more than $19 trillion in debt. When I wrote my speech that I delivered in January, the United States was $18 trillion in debt. When I wrote this book, the United States was $19 trillion in debt. Before I came over here tonight, the United States was $19.25 trillion in debt. You guys are gonna leave here poor tonight by the time we get through with this speech. That's how much we are in debt, and that's how irresponsible Congress is being, and that's why we cannot count on the United States Congress fixing this, and that is precisely why Hamilton and Madison and Ben Franklin and all of them understood we would need Article 5, Section 2, authorizing the states to call a convention to repair the damage that is being wrecked by Washington, D.C. All right. Second category, the executive and the growth of the administrative state. What are you going to do about that? Well, let me respond with a question. Under the United States Constitution, which branch of government is assigned the responsibility to pass laws? That would be the legislative branch. You're precisely right. That's exactly what the Constitution says. Now let me follow up with a question. What percentage of laws that you live under from the federal government are actually even voted on by Congress? The answer is about 6%. About 94% of all the laws, rules, and regulations governing your lives are never even voted on by the people you elect to represent you in Washington, D.C. That goes back and violates a rule that long predates even the United States of America Congress. If you go back to John Locke, and maybe even before Locke, it talks about the compact between the people and those they elect to represent them. And the people that you elect to represent you are accountable to you. You should be able to hire and fire them based upon what they do. That's not how our government works. The laws that we live under are passed by unaccountable, unelected bureaucrats who run the EPA, the IRS, all these alphabet soup federal government agencies. 
I think that's wrong and what I propose uh, is that no agency rule has any binding effect unless and until it is voted on by the United States Congress. Okay, <clears throat> I'm with you, I'm with you, but you are well aware, you are aware in detail that the Federal Register, which publishes all of these rules and regulations, is yay thick year after year after year. So you are either saying that the federal govern government must be transformed, that regulation must shrink to a fraction of what it currently is, or you're saying, you're saying what? That Congress meets 20 hours a day. To, they, they can't read all of this stuff. They can't keep up with it. What's, uh, I'm, you're sure that's not unworkable? You're sure you can find a way to make it work? I'm saying both plus. <laughs> one, one it, it actually will mean that Congress is going to have to work more. That's what they get paid for. Two, hopefully, it will mean in fewer regulations so that entrepreneurs are able to start growing business again instead of having the lid of government put on their aspirations. Uh, but third, the administrative agencies act pursuant to what is called the Take Care Clause in the Constitution. The federal government in the executive branch has the responsibility to take care that the laws are effectively applied. What the administrative branch has done in one single branch has assumed all three responsibilities of government. They make the law, they adjudicate the law, and they enforce the law. That was defined by Madison as tyranny itself. Our federal government has transformed into the very definition of tyranny by Madison by having all three branches of government consigned into one and that one branch is unelectable and unaccountable. The Texas plan in the Supreme Court, <clears throat> I'm going to quote you from that 92-page document, <clears throat> which I now know, I want to repeat, I want to hold this up to camera again. I now know you were only clearing your throat in that 92-pager. <laughs> <laughs> this book is coming out soon. I'm quoting you. The Supreme Court was for the most part able to control its ambitions for the first 170 years of the nation's history, but in modern America, the policy preferences of five robed, unelected septuagenarians will trump even the most politically popular legislation on any topic from voting rights to abortion to religion to speech to criminal procedure to guns to health care to the environment. Close quote. I read that and I thought, that's the angriest sentence in this document. It's the Supreme Court that really gets you, doesn't it? Isn't it? If you think this angry, you need to read this book, because I, I got a lot more in there uh, where, where I fully expose the Supreme Court for what it has become. You know, the Supreme Court, if, if you look at, to get deep here, uh, Federalist 78, Alexander Hamilton said when they created the Supreme Court to begin with, the courts have no will or no, and no force. They are there, they didn't use this phrase, but they are there to call the balls and strikes. They are there to apply the law. Let me ask you this question. I posed you a, a question earlier. How many votes does it take to amend the Constitution? Yeah, the audience knows the answer here. <laughs> most, most people think, well, it's two-thirds of the House and then three-fourths of the state. The fact is the Constitution is amended every single year by five votes of five liberal judges sitting on the United States Supreme Court. If Madison and Hamilton saw that happening, they would never have created the system that we have now. And Governor, you sat on the Supreme Court of Texas for how many years? For about five and a half years. Five and a half years, you sat on the Supreme Court of Texas. And so <clears throat> you ought to be able to find within yourself some sympathy for these jurists in Washington. <laughs> Because after all, we live in a modern, complicated society. It's a much bigger country. It's a much more diverse country. There are all kinds of problems that the founders didn't anticipate, and they, the document has to be permitted to live, doesn't it? You, you really sound like you're from California. <laughs> in a word, no. Uh, it, a judge's job is not to make the law. A judge's job is to apply the law. A judge's job, if I could call out precisely what I put in here, which focuses my anger on Obamacare, is not for a chief justice 
to rewrite the Obamacare law just so that it can live on. If the way Congress wrote it is a way that makes it unconstitutional, your job as a judge is to rule that it's unconstitutional. And we expect to have judges who have the backbone to do exactly that, as opposed to judges who are making up the law. And the problem that Americans have is these judges are rewriting not just the law like Obamacare, they are amending the Constitution itself with all of us being nothing else than helpless subjects of whatever their liberal idea is. So we need to have a way to constrain the Supreme Court the way that Congress is not doing and the way that they are trampling the Constitution. And my plan does that. What amendment would you offer to bring I'll, in the Supreme Court? Well, <clears throat> in the, first, let's go back to your earlier point. My point is to put ideas on the table and to have Americans realize action must be taken and we need some solution. I'm offering an idea. I'm not hard and fast on this, but I think it is the best idea. Happens to exist in some states already. And that is, if you look at the way the founders wrote the Constitution, they wanted it to be hard to amend the Constitution, which is why they have the three-fourths ratification requirement in the Constitution. Why then can a simple majority of Supreme Court justices amend the Constitution? Let me ask you another question. Where is it found that just five of the nine judges on the Supreme Court get to decide what the Constitution is? Where do you find that law? Is it in the Constitution? The answer is no. Is it in some federal statute? The answer is no. It's a rule the Supreme Court made up themselves. Congress should pass a law or Americans should amend the Constitution saying this, and that is, if a court is to strike down a law as unconstitutional or is going to change the Constitution, the court is subject to the same three, four standards that the founders instituted in the Constitution itself. That is the law of the land in Nebraska, in North Dakota. It actually happens to be a supermajority requirement, it happens to be the law of the land in every federal court in a criminal case that requires not a supermajority, but unanimity before a decision is made. And for one key reason, they want to make sure that no mistake occurs before someone's property or life is taken away. Why should we allow the Supreme Court to change our property rights, to change our constitutional rights with a slim five to four majority with five liberals deciding what the fate of the future of America looks like? Until Congress shapes up, <clears throat> until legislatures generally shape up, aren't you running the danger of locking in as, as much, doing as much harm with that amendment as good? So for example, 2008 Heller decision, Justice Scalia writes this great decision which breathes life into the Second Amendment, the, the right to bear arms, which has been left dormant for some seven decades. He goes into the language, it's a brilliant decision, and it's a five to four decision. I think you'd agree it was the correct decision, but it was five to four. If you'd required a supermajority on the court, if you'd required seven justices to overturn what was District of Columbia law in that case, the court would have decided the wrong way. Isn't that right? Well, let's use your example because I'm, I'm going to tell you the freight train that's coming down the track as we speak. And that is the Heller decision was decided five to four uh, with Scalia writing the majority. As we all know, Scalia's seat is open right now. As we all know, Hillary Clinton has said that she would appoint someone who decides the issue the other way. And if Hillary Clinton is elected president, we are going to lose our individual right to keep and bear arms. That embeds an urgency that we take this cause up to protect the Second Amendment, to protect every amendment. All right. Now, you say you're, there are four aspects of the federal government that, that need to be addressed. We've talked about the judiciary. We've talked about Congress. We've talked about the executive. Here's the fourth. And you refer to, you simply talk about it as the 10th amendment, which reads, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution are reserved to the states, close quote. Oh, Governor, that, that horse left the barn decades ago. Can you get that back? You know, I'm really not surprised you're from California. Uh, be, be, because here, here's the deal. You just said that the 10th Amendment left the barn which is the attitude of those in Washington, D.C., and of the intelligentsia across the country. Who, who has the authority to write out the Tenth Amendment? I'll tell you who did write out the Tenth Amendment. The United States Supreme Court wrote it out. 
They upheld the 10th Amendment in 1976 in a case that said that the federal government did not have the authority to tell a state government how much to pay their employees. Nine years later, in a case out of San Antonio in 1985 in Garcia versus San Antonio Metropolitan Transit Authority, the Supreme Court changed its mind. And the Supreme Court said, you know, the 10th Amendment is just too complicated for them to be able to apply. And instead of states having the authority to rely upon the 10th Amendment to challenge a federal law, we, the people of the states, are dependent on those we elect to go service in Washington, D.C. to protect our 10th Amendment rights. That's insanity. That eliminated the 10th Amendment, and that is wrong. And so what I want to do is to reinstate the 10th Amendment the way our founders wrote it, the way that it was intended, the way our country is intended to operate. <clears throat> you get a constitutional convention. Let's stipulate for the state, sake of argument that you get 34 states to petition Congress and Congress calls the, the constitutional convention. Now let me quote John Yu, a lawyer at uh, Cal Berkeley, California. Sorry about that. Berkeley. But he, <laughs> quote, I support wholly the objectives behind Governor Abbott's amendments. But once a convention meets, it could propose any amendments it wants or even completely redesign the Constitution. There's nothing in the text of Article 5 that permits Congress or the states to restrict the scope of the convention. A convention, I fear, would engage in wholesale revolution, which seems to be the call in politics these days from Trump to Sanders. Close quote. A runaway convention. Two things, let's work on nomenclature first. And that is, you said a constitutional convention. A constitutional convention is separate from a convention of states. We're not calling for a constitutional convention where we rewrite the Constitution. We're being very specific here about a convention of states to propose amendments to the Constitution. So the Constitution writ large stays precisely the way that it is. We're looking for just one or two points that we want to clarify in the Constitution by amendments, and that's what you do in a convention of states. Second point, the way that this should be done, states should pass a proposal to join a convention of states with two restrictions. One is a limitation of time, the other is a limitation of subject matter. The state should agree in advance. The only issue that you, this state, let's say Texas, for example, the only issue the state of Texas is authorized to participate in in a convention of states is issues X, Y, and Z. You're not authorized to participate in any issue that goes beyond that. And then they could, if they wanted to, uh, have a trigger clause saying that if, if you act in any way that goes beyond this, your authority is dissolved immediately. Point two, it should have a limitation in time. I would say 10 years. Uh, it should, the authorization by a state should expire after 10 years uh, because we don't know what the political dynamics of the country are going to be 10 or 20 or 50 years from now. And 10 years is arbitrary. It could be 15 years or 20 years. But I, I do think it has to have an expiration time period uh, so that we are operating within the confines of our current political dynamics. Okay. Second point, second objection to the principle, I beg your pardon, second, second objection to the project in principle, so to speak if it is principle that, in any event, here's the objection. It's too hard. It's just too hard. You're asking for 34 states to get together to make a request of Congress, which both houses of Congress must approve, and then the Convention of States takes place, and then 34 states, this is just not going to happen. Greg Abbott likes a good argument, and this is a good argument. We'll give you that. Here we are talking about the Constitution of the United States seriously, and that doesn't happen often enough. We'll give you that. But that's all you're doing is starting a good argument. First, I will tell you, anybody who makes the argument is just too hard is un-American. I sat tonight next to a soldier who sacrificed his life and lost part of his life because he understood that liberty is not too hard to defend. Men and women for centuries have worn the uniform understanding that the phrase just too hard is not going to stop us from fighting for liberty. All I'm asking is for those who are unwilling 
or unable to put on the uniform of the United States military and fight for our liberty, I'm asking you to join us in our cause to fight for liberty by ensuring that we fight for the Constitution that our founders passed. And if you think that's too hard, I can tell you that one person alone was able to make a difference. Let's go back to the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights were originally passed by the very first Congress, and they passed 12 amendments to the United States Constitution. Not 10, but 12. Only 10 were ratified by the states. The other two weren't ratified. There was a student here at the University of Texas in the 1980s who took up a study project in his government class and wrote a paper about how this long lost proposed constitutional amendment could be passed. He got a letter grade of C on the project. But in these pre-internet days, he was committed to fulfilling this mission. And so he started making phone calls and writing letters to capitals across the country. And one state after another agreed with him. And in an amendment that was authored by James Madison and passed by Congress in the 1700s, he, he was able to convince 38 states to agree on, and it became the 27th Amendment to the United States Constitution. One person alone can make a difference. If we galvanize people across this country, we can change the United States of America for the better. Governor, a couple of final questions here, if I may. You write in that, I'm sure this is also going to be in unbroken but unbowed, but you write in that 92-page document, a number of places you say things went wrong about the 1930s. I'm paraphrasing you. Actually, I just read the quotation where you said the Supreme Court was able to control its impulses for 170 years, and then things went wrong. <clears throat> what went wrong? Don't we need to know what, as a historical matter, before we try to correct it, what happened in the 1930s? We know exactly what happened, and, and, and it's, it's a challenge. And We all need to realize that we all face challenges in life. And what matters is not the challenge you face, but how you respond to those challenges. The rule of law faces challenges whenever there is, is danger or, or difficulties. And we face difficulties with the Great Depression in the 1930s. Uh, and the uh, Roosevelt administration used that to change the United States of America. If you recall, there was his attempt to pack the United States Supreme Court. And he was going to keep adding justices to the United States Supreme Court until he got the Supreme Court to agree with his liberal modifications of the laws. Finally, it's what's called the, the switch in time that changed nine. Uh, the Supreme Court began affirming the laws that he passed suddenly overnight. And literally, as I point out in my book, in a two-year time period, uh, the Supreme Court changed its decision, changed its precedent, within a two-year period concerning the Commerce Clause, concerning the Spending Clause, concerning the General Welfare Clause, concerning so many issues. And so it was that switch in time that changed nine on the United States Supreme Court that altered the course of American history. While we're on political culture, an observation, I'm, I'm going to depart from the Constitution, but just for a moment. This gets us back to the Constitution. Trust me, if, if you can, a Californian. California. 1970s, 1980s, Ronald Reagan carries California in 1980 and 84. George H.W. Bush carries California in 1988. Texas, Texas by contrast goes, and since then, it's been almost two decades now since we had a Republican governor in California, and it has reached the stage, the, the state has moved so far to the left, the Republican candidates are happy to raise money there, but they don't spend much money there or much time. They don't campaign for that state. It's gone. You can argue with this, but fundamentally. Texas, it wasn't that long ago that Ralph Yarborough, a liberal Democrat, sat in the Senate. Ann Richards, your three times removed predecessor, called herself a progressive. This state has changed. The, the political culture in Texas has become more conservative, even as in California it has become more liberal. Now, I think that's an important question. What happened? in Texas, what makes Texas different? Because it raises a second question, is it just Texas? Can it be done in other states? How do you address that one? Well, first, understand what happened in Texas was more of a label change uh, than an ideological change. 
Uh, first, you, you look at the creation of Texas to begin with. It was entrepreneurs who came to this land to begin with, and it was that entrepreneurial spirit that was infused in the state from its very beginning. But let's go back to the time of FDR. During the time of FDR, uh, every elected official statewide in the state of Texas and, and most members of Congress were Democrats. However, they opposed the FDR agenda. This, this has gone into in great detail in Robert Carroll's book about LBJ. Remember, Jack Garner uh, was adamantly against FDR and his agenda here in the state of Texas. So it was Sam Rayburn was no liberal. It, it, exactly. And so it, it wasn't so much uh, the political philosophy that's changed. It was the party label uh, that's changed. And, and Texas has come to personify what the Republican brand can be because we've held fast to what allows that entrepreneurial spirit to grow and flourish. It means keeping taxes low, keeping regulations predictable. It means right to work laws. It means litigation reform. It means the kinds of things that allows individuals to have their freedom, to live their own lives and prosper. And that is what, in fact, is attracting people to move to the state more than any other state in the United States of America. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let me quote you one more, a couple last questions here. Let me quote one more time from the Texas plan. Quote, the Constitution itself is not broken. What is broken is our nation's willingness to obey the Constitution. So, of course, the question is, well, if you fix the document through this process you've outlined, Who's to say that we'll be willing to obey it then? Let me read you a couple quotations. These are longish, but, but they're, in fact, they say something I think you'll recognize. And you'll know both the people I'm quoting. Once again, John Yu. Think of where a majority of the nation is right now. Majorities regularly disapprove of the rights in the Bill of Rights when they're polled. My sense is that a majority would probably do away with federalism and judging from Trump's success, transfer power from Congress to the president. You don't want that. Here's a quotation from Hugh Hewitt. Hugh Hewitt's a very good lawyer, and he's a journalist. I'm sure you know him. He's a friend of many of us. Quote, we may be seeing the eclipse of the republic. I'm not an alarmist. It's not the end of the world. But even as the ancient republic of Rome became a more imperial structure, our government has grown so large, its responsibilities so immense, <clears throat> that it will be impossible to take it back. Close quote. Governor, it's too late. It's never too late, it's never too large, never too impossible. That was the attitude that Hamilton and Madison and Franklin and George Washington had. This is America. This isn't some other country. This is a country where, where we can do anything once we realize the necessity of doing it. That's what galvanized the insistence on establishing our United States Constitution to begin with. It's what will galvanize people to come together to make some tweaks to the way the Constitution has been misinterpreted to put us back on the glide path of what our founders intended. What's next? What, you're, you're going to call a special session or, or the legislature's going to just tell me what happens here in Texas yeah. next. What, what happens in Texas next is we come back to session in January. In the meantime, literally as we speak tonight, the room is filled uh, with members of the Texas legislature uh, who are you know, working on ways in which they can come up uh, with plans to pass this. It passed out of the Texas House last session. I think it'll pass out of the Texas Senate this coming session. And so Texas will be one of the many states that are joining this. In just the last few months, we've had Indiana, Tennessee, uh, other states uh, that have joined in and passed uh, these proposals. Now, we have states ranging from the far northwest, Alaska, to the far southeast in Florida that all agree and have passed measures for a convention of states. I think Texas uh, should and will join to be a part of that process. I will be uh, talking about this on a national level uh, as I promote the book and the plan in the book to convince America that now is the time that we are the people to step up and return the United States to the rule of law. Couple of questions, last couple of questions about Greg Abbott. Many people watching this, <clears throat> this uh, vidcast are going to be seeing you for the first time. If I may, just the, the obvious personal question, why are you in a wheelchair? Sure. Uh, freak accident. Uh, I was out jogging one day back in 1984. I was 26 years old, and a big tree came crashing down on my back, and it fractured my vertebrae and my spinal cord, leaving me forever paralyzed. But it is a parallel to what we're talking about. You know, I, I could have given up. I could have said, this is too tough. I just can't come back. Who would have imagined 
that a guy who was paralyzed could get up out of a hospital bed and go on to be governor of the 12th largest economy in the world. So I was broken, but I remain unbowed, which is the title of this book, which is exactly the condition the United States of America is in today. Last question. During the last quarter of a century, you just referred to Texas as the 12th largest economy. The Texas economy has just taken off. Uh, population's grown from 17 million to 27 million in a quarter of a century. That is just exceptional in terms of world history. And you chose to spend those years, that boom, in public service, first as a judge, then as attorney general, now as governor. To be crude about it, you could have been out there making some real money, Governor. You could have been participating in this state's boom. What do you think you're doing? It, it, I pointed out, actually in my book, Broken But Unbowed. <laughs> I, I trace it back to my time when I was in law school. Uh, and I, when I was in law school, that's when I first read all of these cases, where I saw the country drift off course off its constitutional pathway. And I had in my mind when I was in law school, if I ever had the chance to do anything to put the country back on the right pathway, I would take it. And hence, in 1992, I ran to be a state district judge in Houston, Texas, and I began to apply the law. And then, when George Bush was governor of Texas, he appointed me to the Texas Supreme Court, and I got to write opinions that ensure that the rule of law was enforced at the court level. And then one thing just led to another, and now I'm governor today. Greg Abbott, 48th governor of the Lone Star State and the author of the forthcoming Broken But Unbowed, thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Hoover Institution and the Texas Public Policy Foundation, I'm